Good morning, Acton, and welcome to Java with John, hosted by Town Manager John Mangirati. Java with John streams every Friday morning at 10 a.m. on Acton TV's YouTube channel. You can also listen live on the radio at 94.9 FM. Tune in weekly for important information from the Town Manager, Health Department, and Council on Aging, as well as a variety of special guests. Residents can contact us with questions or comments at 978-929-6611 or email manager at actonma.gov. Good morning. Welcome to the Job with John program. Uh, it's May 28th, 2021. And thanks for tuning in on YouTube Live or maybe you're listening on 94.9, our local FM station. Uh, we're, we're wrapping up the month of May here. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, our Veterans Officer and Celebrations Committee is planning a, a nice ceremony uh, to commemorate that occasion on um, Monday, 11.15 a.m. at Woodlawn. Uh, there will not be a parade this year, uh, but, but we hope to bring that back uh, next year. Uh, so this morning, we're going to be talking with uh, Sharon Mercurio, our Council on Aging Director, Karen Martin, the Vice Chair of the Dog Park Committee in Acton, and uh, Select Board Member Jim Snyder-Grant. And we'll be getting, getting to those folks in a moment. I just wanted to give you a few updates. Uh, I will give the public health update. Heather couldn't join us this morning, uh, but there's a lot happening. As I, as I mentioned last week, the governor made some pretty big announcements about uh, where we are reopening uh, across the state. So as of May 29th, which is tomorrow, uh, most of all COVID related restrictions will be lifted uh, at the, from the state level. And that would apply here in Acton as well because uh, very recently, the Acton Board of Health voted to align all of its restrictions with the state restrictions. So uh, we're going to be getting back to normal uh, in many ways. There are still requirements for face coverings in certain situations, which, um, you know, public transportation, school settings, uh, health care settings, and several other things that I encourage you to check into congregate care. Um, and things like that. So there'll still be some face covering requirements, but we're gonna, it's gonna be looking a lot, a lot like uh, normal uh, again, which, which we're very excited about. People did a lot of great work in getting vaccinated and staying away from each other for a long time. And now uh, we can um, try to enjoy each other's company in, in the ways that we used to. So I'm looking, really looking forward to that. Um, other items coming up. So as the pandemic ends, virtual meetings like this one, you know, we're gonna be transitioning away from, we're still trying to learn exactly what changes will be happening from the state level that will dictate how we handle it here locally. Uh, but I know the, the select board is meeting on June 7th to discuss sort of where we are right now and, and what our tentative plan is to transition back to in-person meetings. The Board of Health is also meeting that same night. Both boards will be considering, uh, to, considering ending the local state of emergency that was declared here last March. So that's exciting uh, also. Um, so stay tuned to that meeting. And then, of course, I want you to make sure that you've all seen the town report. Um, if you want a hard copy, let me know. Otherwise, it's available on our website. This is a work that everyone does. This is the history of the town uh, as it occurred last year. So it's worth it's a worth a reading. And a lot of people put a lot of hard work into that. I want to thank Lisa Tommel, uh, who works in the town manager's office, who does the coordination and production of that document. So check it out online or, or come see me if you want a hard copy. Uh, other things you should be looking out for are the municipal monthly. Uh, we, we publish a municipal monthly at the beginning of the month. It, it's probably gonna be 10 pages this, this month because there's a lot happening. So I encourage you to go to your inboxes early on, on uh, June 1st and check it out. Um, so thank you. And why don't we go to Sharon and see what's happening over at the Senior Center. Morning, John. Um, hi, everybody. Just um, we are excited and a little anxious about the new mandate. So now when you come to the senior center, um, no masks, no social distancing. Do want to keep in mind that, you know, it is personal preference and and people may be more comfortable social distancing and still wearing masks. So we just ask that you're respectful for that. We will not be asking people if they're vaccinated. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and again, you know, no judgment. Um, we're, we're moving through this together and we want to stay safe and um, enjoy our, our new freedoms as they, they come. Uh, so 
At this point, we have an outdoor tent and a lot of our programming is happening outdoors. But as we move forward, we're going to be bringing some of those programs indoors. So um, our newsletter does not reflect that because at the time it was a print. Um, the, the new mandates had not been in effect. So um, the next session of exercise classes will actually be moved indoors. So that's exciting. Um, we also have a new drawing class that will remain virtual. Um, so you can sign up for those now. On June 2nd at one o'clock, our book club will be meeting virtually. Um, June 7th, one of our most popular events that's going to be sponsored by the Friends of the Act and Council on Aging is Shredding Day. So from one to four, you can bring up to three bags of materials to um, have shredded. We use Highland Shredding Company. They've been doing it for years with us. Um, you empty your, your bags into a large container. It goes into the truck. It's shredded right on site. There's even a little TV screen if you want to actually watch it being shredded. Um, they've let us do that in the past too. So that will be in June 7th from 1 to 4, and that's for Acton Seniors. Um, then on June 8th, we're going to be starting a, a virtual series called Beautiful Countries, and um, that we're going to visit Ireland on June 8th, and then we'll also be <laughs> visiting Great Britain and Spain. So um, get your, your travel gear ready mm -hmm. and stay at home. <laughs> and then um, Elvis is going to be outside of the building. So on <laughs> June 9th, we're having a live performance in the parking lot at 3.30. Just if you could call and let us know you're coming so we can make sure we have a chair for you, but that will be exciting. Um, it's an AB graduate and actually the son of one of our exercise instructors, Cal Benelli will be here to do Elvis. Um, and just wanted to take a minute to um, remember everybody that lost their lives this Memorial Day protecting our country. So um, thank you for those who serve our country. Thank you, Sharon. So uh, I'd next like to introduce Karen Martin from the Acton Dog Park Committee. And Karen's gonna to talk to us a little bit about what's happening with the Dog Park Committee. Good morning. Good morning, thank you, John. I'm looking forward to representing the Dog Park Committee to share with the viewers the importance of their vote to support the Dog Park at town meeting. Um, please come on Monday, January 21st at 6 p.m. to support the capital budget and to vote no on the citizens petition to exclude funds and to reconsider the location of the dog park. I'd first like to acknowledge the Acton Dog Park Committee who has worked over the three and a half years um, to find the best location for a dog park and to do the research that's needed to put something in place. The members are the chair, Tom Gillespie, um, Mike Perry, Claire Siska, Fred Kinch, and Louisa Callahan and myself as the vice chair. In addition, Kathy Faulkman is heading the Friends of the Acton Dog Park Committee and has um, been very helpful um, since the inception of the committee in her role as the director of recreation, her former role. Joe Will also has been a regular and active uh, attendee and very helpful in the process. Um, we certainly, as a committee, have not worked alone in this process. It's been very collaborative and inclusive. We've worked with all of the town committees from kind of day one with um, Open Space, Commission on Disabilities, Recreation, et cetera. Um, and they've been extremely helpful for us into the process, and we've looked to them for guidance and support. In addition, we've worked very closely with the, the town departments and town government. Our town manager um, has worked with us. Tom Tidman, the National Resources Director, has given us um, tours of properties. Matt Selby, the Economic Development Director, who has experience with the Stanton Grant, has been very helpful, and also the um, engineering department. So we've all worked together in this endeavor. The select board's first directive when the dog park committee was formed was to find out whether or not there was an interest in having a dog park in Acton or not. So that was our first job. We um, researched, we surveyed, we talked with lots of people in a lot of different venues, and people felt very strongly that there should be a dog park in Acton, that it was appropriate to have one. And this came from dog park owners as well as people without dogs, which was very 
um, interesting who felt that it would be a helpful thing to have um, in town. We brought that back to the select board and the next request was for us to determine the best locations for a dog park. Based on the criteria established for an ideal dog park, we visited, revisited and explored over 14 different town properties over the course of three and a half years. In this journey, it became clear that there's not a perfect location um, that would work for everyone. Rather, there was one location that would work best for the town and the needs of the park. And you see that there um, on the screen that we presented to the select board, the site on Main Street at the intersection of Route 2 and 27, which is right next to the Kennedy Nursery where the proposed Action Housing Authority development will be built. Thank you, Sharon, for showing that on the screen. The select board voted to approve the location um, and um, as part of the land that's part of the Stanton grant process. So you see that what the current um, property is like, what we would like to propose is that this property um, is the best fit economically, environmentally, aesthetically, and civically. Um, in terms of the economic piece, and you see in front of you um, a drawing of a very initial design of um, the potential um, area um, that the property that we're looking at. In terms of economics, we're looking at leveraging $21,000 in the capital budget. Um, in return, we will be able to leverage that into two, at least $225,000 in the Stanton grant for the design and construction of the enclosed dog park, which is very economically feasible and also certainly um, um, important fiscally to be able to leverage that amount of money um, for, for the project. We are also actively fundraising to raise additional monies to support items that might not be covered by the grant. And also our dog license fee um, increase will um, be able to support the ongoing maintenance of the park. It's also important for taxpayers to note that dog parks in a town actually increase property values. So everyone benefits from um, the dog park, whether or not they choose to use it um, or not. In terms of environmentally and aesthetically, the development of the proposed property will involve, won't involve any clearing of trees, which was very, very important. Um, to or not significant clearing of trees, which is very important to a lot of residents and to create an attractive um, and pleasing dog park with landscaping. Um, Sharon, if you could show the next picture, that's another example. And you see there a uh, shade element. You also see the, the two sections of the dog park with, with the gate, as well as um, the dog park would be assess uh, handicapped uh, accessible. Um, and the goal is to make it um, attractive and a beautiful gateway in, into Acton. Um, the fourth reason for a dog park is the civic responsibility for our town to support the creation of a commu community spaces that encourage residents to be connected and have a sense of belonging. A dog park develops another community within our town to support members that are isolated, disenfranchised, and disabled. Dog parks encourage and teach new dog owners how to raise their puppies. Dog parks create another opportunity for socialization and exercise, not only for dogs, but for people. As a caring and inclusive community, Acton wants to provide residents with a range of amenities to support their social, emotional, and physical health. Sharon, can you show the next slide? In this slide here, you see also how we would historically, the goal would be to um, mesh the two sides of Route 2, um, kind of have mirror images. You see a potential rendering of the HAA development in the background on the right. And you see um, the, the dog park with potential more historic um, picture um, or um, landscaping to, to match the Hosmer house on the other side of route two. And if Sharon, if you could show the final slide. And here is kind of a bigger 
um, context, which, which is important to, to think about in terms of um, how this would help with the overall master plan um, for this area. We wanted you to envision the potential and the future at this location. These are all just beginning um, drawings and designs. Obviously, a design firm um, would be involved and there would be feedback um, community forums for input from everyone. So we're asking as a committee um, who has spent a lot of time and energy and goodwill moving forward um, with this project to take time to research and learn more about the Acton Community Dog Park through our webpage, Facebook, and the committee page on the town website. We wanna encourage you to feel free to reach out to the committee with any questions and thoughts. Please voice your support in the coming days and attend town meeting um, to support the capital budget and um, the location of the dog park in its current location. Acton deserves a beautiful park as a gateway um, to a, our town that's supported by all. Again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Karen, for the presentation. Uh, You're those welcome. Are interesting renderings. Uh, very thank nice. You. So uh, I'd next like to welcome to the program this morning, uh, select board member, Jim Snyder Grant. Hey, how you doing? Uh, what's going on? What are we talking about? Uh, got some interesting projects in the works, huh? Yeah, yeah. So um, well, I'm also talking about the town meeting that's coming up on the 21st. Um, and in about a week and a half or so, the warrant will get mailed out to households. Uh, and a couple of the warrant articles there are related to buildings and in particular building with clean energy. So uh, these are two warrant articles, which are currently numbered 13 and 14, but stranger, strange things have happened to the numbering of warrant articles, that, but so far, it looks like it's 13 and 14. And um, this is, these are warrant articles that will allow uh, the town to require that new construction of buildings and major rehabilitation uh, would not have new fossil fuel piping coming in, no natural gas, no propane, no oil, and would instead be um, powered by electricity. Um, the reason for it is that we are this, you can think of this in context with the fall 2020 uh, special town meeting where the town passed uh, a, an emergency climate declaration. And um, this, this is a follow-up. Um, a lot of the town's emissions, 40% or more uh, of, of, our, of our greenhouse gas causing emissions are from the use of fossil fuels in buildings. Um, so we wanted to find a way to address that. Um, by, and the reason we're starting with new construction is that with new construction, um, there, there is the opportunity to build from the ground up in a way that's um, environmentally sound and less expensive at the same time. Um, if you're talking residential buildings, um, uh, dual fuel systems, that is systems like if you have um, a natural gas heating system and an electric AC system, that's a lot of different kinds of systems to work together. In a, in a, modern, in a modern house that would be um, powered by heat pumps, maybe geothermal heat pumps or air source heat pumps, and with modern building standards that were well insulated with, with good air sealing, um, this, this kind of construction is, is well understood. It's less expensive than, um, than, than current con dual fuel construction. And um, it's also a great way to stop the problem from getting worse. Once you have fossil fuel coming into a building, it tends to stay that way for decades. And what the science tells us is we have to get away from fossil fuels as quickly as we can. So having new buildings not use fossil fuels is the right next step. Um, there's two articles, and that's because um, there are a number of towns that are looking to make this change. Um, and we've learned from the town of Brookline that we can't do this on our own. Um, the, the attorney general has said that towns uh, that try to have these kinds of regulations would require the support of the legislature to give them, the state legislature, to give them special permission to regulate fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so there is one, one part of the, of the Warren article, which is what we call a home rule petition which is a way of asking the state legislature to give us permission to, to have this. And then the, the other part is the bylaw that says, 
um, that we have to use, um, that builders either have to not use fossil fuels or they have to ask for a waiver. Uh, the building commissioner can offer waivers, uh, and um, if the if the project needs fossil fuels for technical reasons or financial reasons, um, that's that's what the waiver process is for. So that's the basic outline, John, of, of what the warrant articles are about. Yeah, that's not, and the what are the working titles for the articles, just so people at home can remember. Um, is well, we have a building with clean energy as the as the tagline of this of the second Warren article, um, and there is a building with cleanenergy.org where people can learn more about the Warren articles. The the the, the current text of the Warren articles is there, and um, a lot of uh, questions and answers. And I, and I think I heard you say that this would only apply to new construction. So does so people with existing homes, it doesn't apply to them, or how does that? That's work? right. It's um it's new construction and it's um major rehabilitation. So for residential construction, it's seventy if seventy five percent or more of the floor area is involved in the in the building permit work area, that that's like basically taking down everything inside the house and, and rebuilding, then it would apply in those situations. And it would apply in commercial uh, commercial buildings if more than 50% of the floor area is involved. So if you have like a, a large, uh, like a large mall area, um, like we have a lot of strip malls on the Great Road, it would only, this would only apply if more than 50% of that floor area was the subject of a single building permit. So I think that's going to be relatively rare. Great. What what uh, what kind? Of, what's the most frequent question you've had about this uh, proposal since since you started talking about it? I think there's a few a few questions. The one, first one is the one you've already asked. Um, you know, I, do I have to change something in my house? And the answer is no. Um, this is this is for new construction. Um, the next question people are concerned about is how will this impact the prices of, of, of housing. Since we have a housing crisis, houses, houses are more and more expensive, uh, rents are high, house prices are high. And the good news there is that um, building um, electric houses from scratch is less expensive than building the dual fuel houses. So this isn't gonna present any extra burden to what's, what's already uh, been presented. The other part, uh, the other question that people ask is the is what about you know um, the, the upcoming affordable housing? Are, are they going to be impacted by this? And the answer is that um, electric. So if we look at that Main Street, the AHA Main Street proposal that Karen mentioned, the one that's going to be just north of where we're proposing the dog park to be, they've already figured out that it makes more sense financially for them to heat and cool with electricity with 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 heat pumps. Um, they. Um, will need to use natural gas to bring domestic hot water. And in fact, there's a, a particular part of the bylaw that says that if you're providing domestic hot water to a building that's 10,000 square feet or more, you can get a waiver um, because right now, finances and technology don't allow that, don't, don't have a good solution for that without using natural gas. And we expect that for, um, you know, for some, some restaurants or for some other businesses, that they will also have special purpose needs that will require um, um, you know, natural gas or other fossil fuels. And that's why the waiver process is there. Uh, at some point, the technology and the finances will catch up and uh, people will be able to, all, all buildings will be able to go all electric. But for now, it's good to have a waiver process. Right, because if you were talking about this 10 years ago, it would be a lot harder to say that it's easy for the construction industry to handle this, right? I mean, this is, a lot has happened in the last 10 years. That's right, that's right, John. Um, one thing in particular that's changed is the, um, um, the air source heat pump technology has gotten really good at working in cold climate. So if you're if, if, if you're considering this for your own house because you've got maybe your your current heating system is near the end of its life, make sure you work with a contractor who knows about cold climate heat pumps. They can go down to 15 below uh, to keep your house at full temperature and modern houses that are well insulated and have good air sealing are able to hold on to their hold on to that heat for, for a long time. So even if it does dip below minus 15, you're, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go cold. That sounds cold. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. And we look forward to seeing the discussions at town meeting in a few weeks. And, and thanks for being here this morning. So uh, that's, that's all for the program uh, here this morning. And I wish everyone uh, a relaxing weekend and uh, enjoy uh, remembering those we lost on Memorial Day. And we'll pick up again uh, soon with the next job with John.